afternoon. Good afternoon. We meant to be up here a lot earlier than we are today, but it's like 4.30 in the afternoon. <laughs> so it wasn't a quick as a flash start to the day. <laughs> anyway, we've got a really, really nice crossover happening today. I love it when this happens. So I'm going to go and turf out the last of the parsnips that are in the bed. And we're going to sow this year's parsnips same day, not into the same place, but it's quite nice when it all happens on the same day. So the ones that I've got in there were actually grown for the parsnip challenge uh, that we did last year or that before I was really a, like a proper part of uh, Potty Mouth Garden Club. Uh, they did that and I joined in for that one and I was so late. Kept meaning to do it. Uh, <laughs> they're supposed to go in like between, Fe or Gladiator says, between February and May. And I think mine were, went in at like the end of June. So I was lucky that anything happened. Uh, and we did dig some up. Um, it would have been like late November time and they were like fairly disappointing carrots. <laughs> Not a great Christmas harvest. And then we dug a couple more up that were a bit more of a decent size, but I'm just going to take the rest of them out now because they're starting to regrow. I'm going to be optimistic and get the, uh, the fork out, like the proper stand up fork, uh, but maybe I'll probably only need a trowel. Okay, do you want to be witness to parsnip digging? You know, you never know, there might be some excitement. <laughs> We've got one, two, three, very, some very small ones there, four, five of a def, like I, when I say decent size, I mean, they're not prize winners, but th they'll be delicious. And then one, two, three, and then six minis. I'm all right with that. So. These, oh, I've just dropped one, but these ones, not a bad size. I'm not unhappy with that. Uh, they'll roast really nicely and considering when they went in, it's just, it's just amazing there's anything under there. And then there's a couple not so great ones. But yeah, parsnips for dinner, I think. Okay, bit of excitement on the picking front. I'm gonna take out that centerpiece of the white sprouting broccoli that is just starting to like open up, so we need to take it. Quite excited about this. It's been about three years since we've had successful white sprouting broccoli. We had the nine star, which looks very similar, tastes quite different, but. <laughs> oh, just have a look at this unprecedented beauty. Oh, I have to pull the stick up to get in there. All right. Come on, you little piece of gorgeousness. Come to me. Come to me. Oh, look at that. It's so beautiful. Where am I going to cut it? Think about there. Oh, oh the majesty. Mwah. What a beauty. Tiny bit of white fly. Just a bit of 
killing, sorry. Oh, wonderful. Wonderful. And how's the rest of it doing? We've got one in the middle of that one too. Yes, we've got one coming there. But that one's not quite ready. Oh, it's so beautiful. So yeah, these little chaps, um, they, they, obviously they're white, but they don't have a cauliflowery taste. It's very much more it's a milder broccoli taste. It's not quite like purple sprouting, which is really like a big like soccer punch in the jaw of distinctive purple sprouting taste. But it tastes more like purple sprouting than it does a cauliflower, whereas the nine star that looks very similar to this is definitely more of a cauliflower flavor. But I am so excited about eating that tonight. Oh, look at that beauty. Look how gorgeous it is in there, look, little beauty. Actually, I better check the nine star just in case it's busy producing underneath its little shroud. This is the one plant that survived uh, the really heavy frost we had. Not, not this winter just gone, but the previous winter. I lost us. So I had like, how many did I have in here? Six plants, I think. Lost all of them apart from this one. Is anything happening in here yet? These grow quite differently. So whereas there's a bloody slug in there, ah, oh, um, whereas, what am I trying to say? The white spouting broccoli has a little top and then it produces lots of small sprouts of the side. The nine star produces, I mean, I assume that's where it gets its name from, like produces nine really pretty decent cauliflower heads. I was well impressed. But come on. This is not cool. There's a blooming slug right in the centre heart. Come on, you little bastard. Come on, come on. Look at that. Can you see him? But is there anything going on in here other than sluggage? No, not yet. It is a bit early for them. I'm just getting overexcited, to be honest. Look at that. It's huge. We'll, we'll halve that. We can have that each as a starter. I don't think it will go with the kebabs. Um, but we'll have it as the starter. Oh, it looks lovely. better. I've been trying to find a new spot for this table to go uh, actually since we did the 200th episode and uh, I saw that it was in like the original pictures this very table used to be attached to the very first incarnation of shed we had at that end so I was like oh, I've got to use it it's just been jammed like behind the greenhouse for the last god knows how many years 
Um, and I really wanted to kind of reinstate it somewhere. And we've had the little table outside here and I just thought this is the perfect spot for it because mum can put her basket on here when she arrives and it's all like, you know, it's all nice. <laughs> we do normally have, uh, in the summer, we've got that fantastic round swing seat thing that hangs from the thing that uh, is from Raw Studios. Um, and we'll probably reinstate that in the summer. Although I would love to find a better spot for it like somewhere that was a bit more out in the open, but so far I haven't found somewhere. So uh, the area has been assigned to table duties for the time being. Well, anyway, when we were here yesterday, we got rained off and it was just a bit of a flat out disaster. I had a lot of things I wanted to do. We got up here really late and the long and the short of it is I achieved very little apart from digging those parsnips out. That was about the limit of achievement. <laughs> so we're back to try again today. Uh, so I am going to try and sow the parsnips today, or well, not try, I am going to sow the parsnips, be positive, Jesse, going to sow the parsnips. But what I'm going to do before I do that is, you know, the really super floppy uh, broad beans that we brought up the other day? Well, they've been being dragged in and out of the greenhouse and they've toughened up enough, I think, especially seems the weather here at the moment, like it's not getting, it's like 15, 16 in the day and it's not getting below about nine at night. So I think they'll have good time to kind of harden up outside. And I'm going to put them in the same bed that I put the rest of the broad beans in. Now, last week I uncovered the broad beans. What was left underneath, because I don't know if you remember, the, that lot went out really when they were too soft. So I had to cover them in fleece. And you know, out of sight, out of mind, they've just been hidden under that fleece for weeks and hadn't quite realized that uh, the slugs had also been hiding under that fleece. So they're looking very, very sad. They're not beautiful specimens. <laughs> but anyway, I'm going to join them with some also not beautiful specimens in that bed. They are planted along where we had the tomatoes last year, which is that like really strong structure up the center of the bed. And I'm going to put tomatoes back in there this year, which is why broad beans are quite a good option because they'll be out by the time I need to get the tomatoes in. But obviously I've got more than nine broad beans. So I'm going to kind of uh, use that same structure so that it's got the strength of that central piece, but I'm going to kind of like spread it sideways. So it's a bit more like this um, and then plant the rest of the broad beans. So that is my first task. Uh, and then we'll I'll just get that done. And then we'll think about what's next. This bed, uh, you know, this is the bed that we had the uh, dahlias and the tulips in the last couple of years. Well, they've actually, um, although we dug what we thought, we dug most of them out. She has loads of tulips left in here. And we're going to uh, leave them be until we know which ones are worth anything because they multiplied a lot, but never flowered. So uh, we're just going to leave them. So this is going to be kind of a hybrid broad bean slash dodgy tulip bed uh, to begin with. And we'll... <laughs> And we'll deal with deal with them once once we know whether they're going to flower or not. Ah. Right, let's go get some beans. So 
So if you remember, those broad beans were sewn into, a bit much for one hand, sorry. <laughs> were sewn into these very fancy root trainers like the upgraded posh version of the old school wound trainers I used to have. And this is the first time I'm gonna really be getting anything out of them. So let's have a look if they've done their job. Okay, so although they are much tougher and recovered from how awful they looked in the conservatory, they are still a little bit like spaghetti beans. And I don't wanna snap them when I take them out. So let's just try and there we go. There we go. Oh, I can feel the roots underneath. Wow. Woo! They've got some good root. Oh, there's a blooming slug in there. Why is there a slug everywhere I look? Okay, right, well, let's open these up. Oh, it's stuck down there now. Okay, so these should just pop off neatly. Look at those roots. So the point of the root trainers is to do exactly that. So don't tell me it's raining again. Uh, it was bright sunshine this morning. Um, yeah, so you shouldn't, you know when you have to push a plant out the bottom of a pot. Um, these, you don't have to, so they should just wiggle out, except that I've left them in there a little bit long, so they're a bit attached, but let's try without me, like, oh, holding it up with one hand. They should just pop out, like that. Now, if I hadn't left these in there for quite so long, they wouldn't have, wouldn't have got in with each other, but then you end up with something like that. Look, beautiful, beautiful plant. Just realised I've forgotten the trowel though, so I better go and get that first. One thing we are going to have to be really careful with is uh, eye poking here. So I might get some caps to put on over these. I mean, it's pretty obvious that it's there. It's not like when you've got one sole cane, but still. Um, before somebody tells me in the comments that I've got to be careful of my eyes, I'm on it, I promise.
Absolute menaces. I'll have to uh, go and get the rake again. But anyway, I'm actually going to get the parsnips in. <laughs> hey, I've got to do it again, girls. Hmm? Menaces in the garden, you are. Absolute menaces. Oh, a bit of sunshine. Righty ho, the, oh, that's bright. <laughs> the uh, variety that I'm gonna do is called Hollow Crown. This packet's already open, they're still viable, so I'm gonna put these in. We might always sow some um, gladiator later on because like obviously the ones that we dug up the other day, okay, not the greatest specimens of parsnips one has ever seen, but they were decent and they weren't sown until about June. So we do have the chance of uh, going again a little bit later. So I'm going to put these, they say about 40 centimetres apart rows for parsnips. But I think they're thinking that my parsnips are going to be bigger than they are. So I'm going to go 30 centimetres. Just do two, two rows. That will be fine. And eventually the spacing between them is supposed to be about 20 centimetres. Um, but then you've always got the problem with parsnips because you have, because uh, then you talk, oh God, that's bright. <sighs> Might just turn the camera around the other way. One sec. Is that better? Yes, it is. Right. What was I saying? Yeah, end spacing for the parsnips want to be about 20 centimetres apart, you know, this sort of um, distance. However, it's always the dilemma with doing parsnips because germination is notoriously poor on parsnips. And there are kind of ways of going around that. You can germinate them first on wet kitchen roll so you know which one's actually going to germinate. So that gives you a much higher percentage of success when you actually put them in. But I'm not doing that this year. Um, I did that last year, actually. It was really successful. Sorry, my old legs are cramping up. <laughs> um, yeah, so you've got a dilemma. So when you plant them in the soil, they take quite a long time to germinate. And wisdom always used to be, well, you put two or three in each hole that you're sowing into, and then you take out the, the weakest ones of them. So you're left with you're going to almost a guarantee that at least one of them is going to come up on each one of your planting spaces. Parsnips absolutely hate being disturbed. Like that's their major thing. So if ever you go into a supermarket and they're selling, or not a supermarket, but actually, I'm getting ahead of myself here, but I was about to say, if you go to a garden centre and they're selling, you know, start plugs, like little pre, pre-sown plants of parsnips or carrots, don't do it. It's a scam. They will never work. <laughs> um, they just won't ever work. So there is no point. Hello, girls. Hello, girlies. No, this is parsnip seed, not for girls. Um... The chances of you being able to transplant a tiny little seedling without just even putting a kink in that taproot is just infinitesimally small and not going to happen. You stay away from these, woman. Uh, but the other day I was at um, Squires in just on the other side of Twickenham and they had masses. Have a look at this. I don't think I've ever seen so many starter plants on like the second week of March before. They've got everything here. Got salad and brassicas and onions. This is all very early, chaps. Okay, so what I'm going to do with these is sow them about five or so centimetres apart all the way along in the hope that generally one in three of them is going to sort of germinate. And I will be able to kind of, if there are two that are too close together, I'll be able to pick them out. Um, the thing to do is to not move them, though. I find it so... I find it so tricky 
thinning stuff if there isn't like thinning carrots is all right as long as you leave them until like you've got baby carrots because you're still getting something out of it but doing things like parsnips where you've got to thin them before they've actually produced anything I'm always trying to save the plants and like trying to replant them and make other rows of them and things and the thing is is it never works it just doesn't work so when I'm thinning these out I'm just going to thin them out I'm going to take them and discard them so if you see me thinning these out later in the year and I'm like oh I'll just these ones they look all right I'll just nip them in another row like in the comments please just just shout at me because it doesn't work I do it every year and it doesn't work but that is why you it's no point buying um parsnip seeds when they've already germinated in the um from the supermarket or from the garden center because it's just a pointless pointless waste of time there's another aeroplane going over i don't know if you can hear it but i'm so like trained to stop talking when there's an aeroplane uh i haven't quite got used to the fact that i don't need to do that anymore so sorry for all this pausing um what was i going to say yeah so this bed these lettuces were on this side of the bed when we did the plot tour couple of weeks ago I was showing you these lettuces and how pleased I was with them and how they were looking really lovely coming along nicely and that we were going to get a really good early spring crop from them well the next day I came up here and somebody had dug them all up hence they're now in a different area of the bed this end was just so churned up uh, which means that I'm going to cover these for two reasons I'm going to cover them like sometimes people do with carrots because they need a really consistent amount of moisture to germinate so by watering them in and then laying something on top you can really keep the moisture in because they want to be sown quite shallowly you don't want to bury them you know a foot underneath the ground they're only small uh, they are very easy it's very easy to dry out when they're not too too deep in the ground so just by covering them you just give them a little bit of an extra chance to germinate without drying out so I'm going to do it for that reason but I'm also going to do it so that they don't get dug up because this bed has become a bit of a target to whoever it is who's digging it up those poor lettuces over there have, have come out the ground about four times now luckily Luckily, they are tough as old boots, so they seem to have survived it okay. <laughs> Don't you lettuces? I know. Actually, when I was just raking this up the first time before the chickens ruined it, uh, that was one that I found buried. <laughs> Hence, it's like been blanched, uh, but that, that should be fine. It should be fine. I'm not doing too many parsnips um, because although I love a roasted parsnip, um, I really, really can't stand parsnip soup, which is obviously the easiest way to use up anything that you have an excess of. Because um, I don't know why I don't like it, but I don't. It's just too strong a flavour of parsnip. And uh, I've really put myself off in the past by having a a huge deluge of, of parsnips to use made parsnip soup and then really put myself enough I haven't even been able to eat them roasted after that so I've learned my lesson that is the that's the thing you get asked a lot or I get asked a lot like what would be your most fundamental piece of advice the first one is always related to um, allotment guilt and making sure that it's okay and you make it okay for yourself to just come up to the allotment and enjoy it and don't always need to be doing something you know it's it's important because otherwise you end up with allotment guilt and then you don't come so that'd be my first advice second advice is grow things that you want to eat in the quantity that you want to eat them uh we've been having this discussion about pumpkins actually uh i love the taste of crown prince pumpkins but they're just too big for us ichikakuri's great hang on where was my lines here do you think and here maybe Oh dear, I should have been paying more attention. Um, yeah, but they're too big, uh, the crown prints. Um, so this year we're looking for varieties of pumpkin that are really small. I think there's one called Baby Bear. Uh, if anybody's got any suggestions for really good tasting small pumpkins. And when I say small pumpkins, I'm talking like this sort of size pumpkin. 
uh, yeah, I'm on the lookout for recommendations for those. Okay, let me get some markers because I've already forgotten where they are. I haven't um, used the clear plastic for any reason. It's not like they need light or anything. Uh, it's just that I don't have any wooden planks that are the right size and they fit perfectly. They're just left over from, I was gonna build, build um, a new lid for the cold frame with them. But they also fit in there really snugly. So I don't think anything's gonna dig them up. I might just put a little a few pegs on either side, but yeah, right. Okay, let's move on to carrots. Tell you what, it's like hokey cokey with the coats today. Can't tell if I'm hot, cold, sun comes out, rain starts. Right, what did I say I was doing? Carrots. Now my normal variety of carrots is always Touchon, as I've mentioned many times before, but I've got my Touchon in the post at the moment coming from real seeds. Uh, but I do have some early Nant, which are uh, still in date. So a lot of the carrot seed that I had when I actually looked at it was all like, so by 2019. Hmm. <laughs> so yeah, these ones are actually in date. I'm going to use some of the compost or the soil that I dug out of the non ratty end of the, I think sun's out again. I'm going to use some of the soil <laughs> that I dug out of the non ratty end of the polytunnel to top up the carrot box bed thing that we've got at that end. And then we've got like the perfectly fitting carrot root fly box made of the EnviroMesh that goes over the top of it. So I'm going to use some of that really nice fluffy soil that came out of the polytunnel, stick that in there. And I'm also going to fill up a trough. The trough that the, sorry, I'm like, Ooh, uh, because I can't think where I had it. It was in the greenhouse. Oh no, I know what I did. It was the one that had the Kingsland white garlic that never came up. And when we dug it up, it just had done nothing. Um, so I emptied that trough out and I'm going to use that trough to just to sow some early carrots. And then as soon as the Touchon arrive, I'll sow them up in the bed because it's not too early to be sowing them outside if your soil's warmed up. Uh, and that soil, because it's like raised and it's um, right in the like morning sunshine, it's quite warm. So they should be all right. I'm going to sew into the like window box trough to uh, get some started early in the greenhouse. And there it is. Lovely. Right. Let's go and fill up the box up there and fill up this. Do I want my coat on? I'm not sure. used a spade for this <laughs> I'll um I'll get the shovel when I'm doing the the big box over there but yes yeah, so I'm going to sow my carrots in here I've already got um the carrots growing away actually in the um greenhouse that is, that were the ones that we sowed in autumn uh they're actually that one that survived from the first sowings looking fantastic like like pickable fantastic i haven't really 
had a root around in it but from like its top growth it looks fantastic such a shame the rest of them got eaten <laughs> that's cool that'll do mm, yeah I've squished this down a bit so it's a little bit more compact than just like loose looseness and let's get some carrots in oh. God, everything needs a really good water in here I was saying last week that the strategy for um, our growing at home in the uh, conservatory has obviously had to change because we've got this kind of looming uh, unknown deadline over us to clear it out but I think also this year I, because of that I am going to sow a lot more directly up here and just really try and protect it from the slugs because the main advantage really of home now we've got into March is not temperature really it's just slug damage and bug damage but I'm going to get me some nematodes and um, get the floor down in here, which is obviously the first priority. I'm gonna go and see if we can do something about that tomorrow. Um, and then I'm gonna nematode the hell out of it in here, uh, slug nematodes, and uh, hope that we can keep just in here. I mean, it's impossible to do the whole allotment. I mean, say impossible. I'm not, I haven't won the lottery. <laughs> so I'm not gonna be trying to keep slugs off my entire allotment with nematodes because I just think that is a, it's just not going to work. However, in areas that you've got pots and in here and in the polytunnel and sort of various areas like around the outside of the shed over there where I'm going to be growing, you know, it's going to be lots of tender dahlias and stuff starting off over there. I'm just going to nematode them because they does work really, really well. Uh, I do have a video on nematodes, actually. Might see if I can from quite a long time ago, but I'll see if I can link it at the end of this video, or at least the link will be underneath if I can find the video. Um, yeah, but that's what I'm going to do. So I'm going to order my nematodes this week, get all of this stuff started in here. Jolly, jolly, happy, happy. And um, yeah, try and do a bit of defense and try and start most stuff up here rather than at home this year. But let me show you that one carrot that's doing really well. So these are my carrot boxes. Please excuse the enormous amount of parsley that's in your way. Is that better? Yeah, although you can't see my face, but you know, that is not a handicap. Uh, so these are the carrots which were the second sowing. They are coming along really well, but this beast, this beast is the one from the first sowing. And I mean, it's, four times the size of the others and I just can you see that there is carrot under there Woo! so next year that's what I'm going to be doing I'm going to be doing overwintering carrots and trying to keep the slugs off them because I mean potentially we could have been picking two huge boxes but I say huge boxes they're not huge we could have been picking two medium-sized polystyrene boxes uh worth of carrots now like mid-march that would have been wonderful instead of just one but still <laughs> I'll get a spade. No wonder this was looking so long. Uh, no, I think I should just, I should be able to just, we don't need that much of it. I'll just get the shovel.
Okay, I've washed out the uh, root trainer that I took the broad beans out of, just gave it a quick rinse, refilled it with soil, we're ready to go again. And I said before, obviously root trainers, because they've got that really deep root, are excellent for legumes or anything in like the pea bean kind of family in general, because, because they have that really strong deep root system really early on in their life. So I have got two varieties of sweet pea that are going in. I've got a pink one and a white one. I never have much luck with sweet peas. I'm just going to throw that out there. Um, we get the odd year where they're fantastic. And then the rest of the years they just dry up and we get a lot of mildew. And I think the main issue that we have is the watering situation. We just don't give them enough water. So this year, <laughs> watering mission on the sweet peas. I'm also going to stick some sugar snap peas in. I love sugar snap peas. So you stick those in. And luckily, I mean, another thing that sort of legumes are generally quite well known for, particularly this type of uh, peas and beans, is that they grow really quickly. And I'm hoping that these are going to be out of these by mid-April. So in a month's time, I'm hoping to be able to turf them out because that's when I'll be sowing my beans proper. And I want these uh, root trainers for that. So let's get these in. Now, I don't think there's many sweet peas actually in these packets. So I'm just going to mix them up. I don't want them like ones hardly anything in there you never get anything in sweet peas i'm just going to tip them in together mix them all around and then sew them and then sew them two to a piece the two sweet pea varieties that i'm doing are tara and white supreme so they have a good like pink white mix going on but yeah look at that two packets of sweet peas that's all we got on to the sugar snaps i'm also going to sew two of these in each despite them being much larger but my goodness do you get an awful lot more seed in a packet of peas than you do sweet peas i don't remember sweet peas coming in such stingy packets in the past so, and i don't remember them being wildly expensive either the last couple of years i've been absolutely flabbergasted by the price of sweet peas Something I should do, talking about, well, whinging about the price of sweet peas, is save my own um, sweet pea seed, which we always used to do. Um, in fact, what we used to do is when we had them like growing up, by the end of the season, you just let some of the pods kind of um, mature and then just drop and then you get them to sort of come up the next year. Last couple of years we've tried that, it hasn't really worked, so I've gone back to buying them from scratch. I'll try again this year. Maybe the reason that it hasn't worked is because uh, we just haven't watered the sweet peas and they've been such poor specimens. They haven't even bothered to set seed. Who knows? Yeah, we've got another, another couple of full trays in there. Oh man, am I looking forward to eating these. Funnily enough, actually, sugar snap peas is not something I particularly like cooked. Um, I just, it's one of those like walk around the garden and eat type scenarios is one of the reasons I like getting them started so early because that like really early spring joy of just like peas and oh yeah it's just wonderful I am so excited about spring so I've got my sweet peas and I've got some sugar snap in there's about 40 more things on my March sewing list I am so behind so behind <laughs> what am I doing sugar snap sugar snap I mean, so many flowers. I've got to get the nasturtiums in. Oh, at least the parsnips, the carrots, the sugar snaps are in. I've made a start. I've made a start. I've realised it's actually St. Patrick's Day tomorrow. Um, snap. Uh, sh yeah, St. Patrick's Day tomorrow, which isn't only... For drinking Guinness is also supposed to be the day that you sew like traditional kind of sewing days so I've just realized I'm a bit out of camera here aren't I let me just get up a bit there we go it's also supposedly the day you get your first earlies into the bed um, or into your pots 
But my first earlies this year was supposed to be the Red Duke of York. And actually, when I was showing you that um, absolute haul of really super early, scarily early veg from Squires earlier that we discovered, um, that's what we'd gone there looking for was Red Duke. So somebody in the comments last week said that they still have them at Chapman's. So whizzed over to Chapman's, they'd sold out, unfortunately. We obviously just missed them. Um, and so kind of just one, like a couple of roads up from there is the Squires. So we went there and when we first came, went in there, like in January or whatever, uh, they had masses of Red Duke. Well, not a sausage left. So we are still without some Red Dukes. We're just going to have to bite the bullet and order them online, I think. But it means that they're not going to be in for St. Patrick's Day. What would that be tomorrow? Sugar snap. Sugar snap. Right, uh, water these in, water the carrots in, um, and then we've got some things to pick for dinner. I think we're done for the day, but the afternoon has turned out absolutely beautiful. Well, this is exciting. First bit of purple sprouting of the year. Oh, look at that beauty. Cheers, chaps. This was supposed to be a Guinness in honour of St. Patrick's Day. Unfortunately, they only had uh, alcohol-free Guinness, which, I mean, wouldn't be the end of the world, but they were selling them in, like, huge boxes. And I tell you what I don't need in my life is 12 cans of alcohol-free Guinness. <laughs> so we've got a glass of wine. Mm. And can you believe it's the middle of March? already because I can't <laughs> just this month has gone so fast January as always was so slow February doesn't even seem to have happened and then all of a sudden we're halfway through March and uh, my seed sowing list like I mentioned last week was so long at least we got some things started this week got the parsnips in uh, which hopefully we'll actually get some good parsnips this year because the year before we had fantastic parsnips but last year obviously I was so late these ones are going to have like a good three and a half, four months extra growing time than, um, than the ones that we we're digging out today. But despite their size, they were absolutely delicious, those little parsnips. They hadn't started growing. You know, I was saying last week that um, I was worried that they were going to start getting a woody core because they'd started regrowing at the top. They were fine. We caught them in time. So, yeah, they were absolutely delicious. Just small. So fingers crossed for next year's parsnips. 
<laughs> but we also got the carrots in, which is good. Uh, one of the things that I really, really need to get going with, though, are things like the Cosmos. Uh, the Antirhinums are all up, which is very exciting. I mean, they're the funniest little seedlings, Antirhinums. They're like, they're so tiny, absolutely tiny. They're a bit like uh, celery or celeriac seedlings, which are also like comedically small. But yeah, next week, next week is going to be an absolute sewing marathon. And uh, to protect them, I'm going to be ordering my nematodes this evening. I'll put a link underneath to where I buy mine from. Um, they're pretty good. I've never had a problem with them. And they also allow you to buy like kind of, it's not really a subscription, but you can like order them for now and then they'll send them to you again in like three months time or whatever the interval is that you want. So it kind of reminds you, they just arrive on your doorstep in time for you to do the next kind of nematode session. So that's what I'm gonna be doing this year. Uh, to try and avoid this slug because already, like I say, it's only two weeks into March and there's slugs everywhere. Everything I pick up has got a slug underneath it. Two other things to mention. Firstly, um, I'm getting to grips with what I can and can't just record through sound wise using the microphone. You know, I'm under the flight path for Heathrow. So that's why I've got so many problems with the airplanes. They're, they're coming into land basically right over the top of the allotment. And but they come in on two different pathways. And if they're on the pathway, which is slightly further north than we are, the microphone doesn't pick it up at all. And I can keep recording. I have to remember that when they are coming down the like the middle path, which is just slightly further over the allotment, I can't because uh, you will have noticed in today's video that there's sort of a strange. It doesn't sound like an aeroplane, but it's like this sort of strange, like slightly echoey, weird alien noise going on in the background. And that is the microphone struggling to pick me up over the sound of the aeroplane. So now I know that, now I've worked out what that is, we won't be doing that again. So that was the last time you'll hear that sort of noise in the background. And the other thing to say is cheers to you lot. Cheers to my incredible patrons, who are the names you always see at the end of the video. They're the people who support this channel and uh, just keep it going, basically. It's all on their heads. It's their fault. <laughs> uh, and thanks to everybody else who watches every week. This is a blooming long video. I'll see you next week, chaps. Mm. Cheers.